Um, well, uh, as probably many of you know, every year the faculty, now there's 47 of us actually, of the Integrative Center for Learning and Memory nominates individuals that have made extraordinary contributions to learning and memory. Then the whole faculty votes on the nominations and the person with the most votes is invited to give that year's Integrative Center for Learning and Memory Distinguished Lecture. It is a unique pleasure for me to introduce this year's ICLM Distinguished Lecturer, my friend, Eric Lunn. Eric got his PhD in biochemistry in 1989 in the Sheldon Lab in the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. He then went on to do a postdoc at Baylor uh, with David Sweat, where he made several really wonderful uh, you know, uh, contributions including the finding that persistent protein kinase activity is key to long-term potentiation memory. He also actually published a number of papers and I was counting them. I was like, wait a second, how could you publish all these papers as a graduate student <laughs> in the role of, of, of protein kinase C in long-term uh, 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 potentiation and memory? After his postdoc in, 19, in 1994, he set up his own lab at the University of Pittsburgh. And in 2001, he moved his lab to Baylor. Then in 2007, he relocated to NYU, where he's now professor and chair in the Center for Neuroscience. His lab has had the leading role, I think he's the very leader of this field in establishing the importance of molecular translation mechanisms in plasticity memory, in Alzheimer's, in autism, and in a number of neurodevelopmental disorders, including fragile X, tuberous sclerosis, Angelman syndrome, et cetera. This, it truly is an incredible body of work that has had and continues to have a really deep impact in both basic and, and translation neuroscience studies. You probably caught up his recent paper in Nature where his lab showed that translation regulation, specifically in inhibitory neurons is also critical for memory, a topic that he may revisit you know, today, I, I think, I'm not, you know, not really sure. In addition to these phenomenal basic science and, and translation you know, contributions, Eric's lab has also developed a number of powerful tools that labs in the field now use to study translation in the CNS, including tools to visualize and manipulate uh, uh, translation, as well as techniques to identify translating mRNAs and newly synthesized proteins. But that's not all. Eric's lab has also made a number of other important contributions, including discovering that the reactive oxygen species ROS you know, previously thought to be a neurotoxic molecule, it's actually a signaling molecule that, mo that modulates plasticity and memory. Uh, his lab also had a key role in uncovering novel molecular and cellular mechanisms underlying Alzheimer's, including the role of ROS, SOD, IF2-alpha, mitochondrial pathways, and glucagon-like type 1, just you know, to name a few. As you may imagine, these important contributions have have been recognized with awards and prizes, including membership in the, in the American Association for Advancement of Science, a Javits Award, NARSED Distinguished Investigator Award, was elected president of Molecular and Cellular Cognition Society, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, today's Eric seminar will be entitled Cell Type Specific and Local Translation in Memory. And without further ado, now that I've, took, I've taken most of his time, it is a great pleasure. To, to present this year's ICLM Distinguished Investigator, Dorek, uh, Dr. Eric Klein. Welcome, Eric. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Alcina, for that uh, very generous, kind introduction. It's uh, great to be here virtually. Uh, it would be better to be uh, in Los Angeles than in New York City right now, um, as you could imagine. It's actually frigid today. Um, and. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I'm glad that we could do this virtually. As I was telling Alcino um, before we started, um, this is the first time I've wore a shirt with a collar in a year um, because I've spent a lot of the pandemic uh, here at this uh, place, which is in the Catskills at, at our house up there. So it's a, it's a really great honor to be here and to give this lecture. Um, I have so many good friends and colleagues at UCLA that have really influenced and really inspired our work, which I'll talk about some today that was a direct inspiration actually from Alcino's work. Um, 
So um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, Alcina. So um, for about the last 20 years, we've been particularly interested, as Alcina said, in understanding how translation is regulated in the nervous system, um, how de novo protein synthesis is involved in memory consolidation, and how, when it's dysregulated, it might contribute to various types of brain disorders. And since this is a Center for Learning and Memory talk, I'm not going to talk about disease uh, very much today, but rather I'll just focus mainly on our work on memory. And we've been interested in translation in the context of memory because it's been known almost 60 years now that in order to convert short-term memory to long-term memory, one needs to have de novo protein synthesis. And so um, we have studied uh, protein synthesis in this context for a number of years, and we focused on translation initiation, which is the rate limiting step in protein synthesis. So most of you probably uh, are aware that for many years, people have used compounds like cyclohexamide and anisomycin to disrupt memory consolidation for various reasons. Um, and both of these um, drugs target elongation and not, um, not initiation. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about two modes of translational control at the initiation step today. Um, the first is um, EIF2. So EIF2 um, is a, a heterotrimer that has alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. It, this is a complex that's um, required to bring the initiator transfer uh, RNA to the ribosome. Uh, and it does this in a GTP dependent manner. And once this uh, occurs, it forms what's called the 43S pre-initiation complex, um, which is shown here. The second step in translation initiation is the bringing of this complex to the messenger RNA, which is promoted by a complex called EIF4, which consists of EIF4E, EIF4G, and EIF4A. Um, EIF4G is a scaffolding molecule, EIF4A is a dead box helicase, and EIF4E is what binds to the five prime methylated cap of the messenger RNA as shown here. And although this is not absolutely required for translation initiation, it's thought to be um, necessary for gene-specific translation, particularly of messenger RNAs that have uh, long and, and complicated five prime UTRs with a lot of secondary structure, because the dead box helicase then can unwind the superstructure and allow the ribosome to start the codon so the elongation can begin. Now this step is um, regulated by this very complicated signaling cascade. Many of you are familiar with um, this kinase mTOR. Uh, when it's in a complex with Raptor, it's known as mTOR1. And this is um, what controls much of uh, EIF4E dependent translation. So mTORC can phosphorylate a translational repressor known as 4E binding protein, which normally binds to and suppresses EIF4E. mTORC1 also um, phosphorylates and activates a kinase called P70S6 kinase or S6K1, which has multiple substrates that are involved in both initiation uh, as well as translation elongation. So activation of this um, complex gives rise to translation initiation by, by both of these pathways. I'm not gonna talk about um, S6K1 signaling, although we do a lot of work on this in the context of, trans, uh, of fragile X syndrome. So um, you're probably familiar with the compound rapamycin, which disrupts this complex. So rapamycin, once bound to FKBB12, will prevent the interaction of mTOR with Raptor and thereby limit its access to its substrates for EBP2 and S6K1. So over the years, uh, a number of labs have shown that this pathway um, is activated in um, various types of plasticity and memory. And if you pharmacologically or genetically inhibit the pathway, you can prevent uh, long lasting plasticity and memory. Now, about um, 10 years ago, we began um, studying um, the specifics of mTORC1 uh, downstream in, the, in memory consolidation. And these initial studies were done in collaboration with 
um, Joe Ledoux, and all the work I'm going to talk about today is on auditory threat memory. And so you're um, all familiar with this type of Pavlovian conditioning where um, audible tones are paired with foot shocks and uh, the animal's memory is tested by, uh, in this case, um, yeah. either putting the uh, animal back in the same conditioning chamber or putting it in a different conditioning chamber and playing the audible tone. And so we'll be talking about um, cued threat memory today, which is assayed by freezing, which uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with. So many years ago, uh, Chuck Hofer and Kariana Collinsage, uh, when they were in the lab in collaboration with, Ju with Joe Ledoux, showed that if you infuse a, a compound called 4EGI1 into the uh, lateral amygdala, uh, it will block memory consolidation. And so this compound disrupts the interaction of EIF4E with EIF4G, um, thereby um, blocking cap-dependent translation. And then subsequently, in collaboration with um, Joe and Linnea Ostroff, um, uh, we showed that um, EIF4E is required for conditioning-induced um, increases in polyribosomes in dendritic spines in the lateral amygdala. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later uh, in the lecture. So, um, so, you know, pharmacological studies like this are very useful, and they can give you some details about molecular mechanisms. But I can remember um, being inspired by Alcino because oftentimes at meetings he would say, you know, as molecular neurobiologists, um, we need to bring um, our knowledge of mechanism to bear in order to ask uh, circuit and systems like questions. And so um, based on that, um, we decided to do that. Now, I'm showing this, I like this diagram. This is from a 2002 review from Joe Ledoux because when I started this work, this is my uh, extent of knowledge of amygdala circuitry. So, um, and so the reason I like this is because um, one of the questions we had was if de novo translation, especially, especially EIF4E dependent translation in the amygdala is required for memory consolidation, what, what cell types is it required? And of course, pharmacological approaches um, can't um, allow you to know this. So based on the work of Joe and, and Mike Fanslow and others, we had known that um, these pyramidal neurons in, in the lateral amygdala were very important for memory consolidation. This is where the association between the, the CS, which is the tone, and the US, which is the foot shock, take place. And Joe and Pat Gallagher's work had shown that um, there's LTP that's induced with conditioning in these pyramidal neurons or in these principal excitatory neurons. And so we would hypothesize that translation would be required in these neurons in order for memory consolidation to take place. But of course, we didn't know that for sure. So um, by, uh, by uh, the good luck, the uh, good fortune that I had, Priyana Shrestha joined my laboratory uh, uh, in 2014. And she had very specific ideas that she wanted to um, to define the cell types in which you needed translation in order for memory consolidation to take place. And so the first approach that um, Priyana took was to take advantage of a mouse that had been um, generated by Jerry Pellete, who's a cancer researcher at McGill University. And these mice um, have a, a express a, a, a short hairpin uh, MR, uh, microRNA for 4E, a synthetic one and it's tagged with GFP and upstream, um, there's a TET responsive element. So what Priyana decided to do was take these mice and then either use Cree mouse lines or Cree expressing viruses, uh, along with a pre-dependent TTA that was generously given to us by Hong Kui Zhang at the um, uh, Allen Brain Institute. And what this allowed Priyana to do was um, when the animals were on docks, you would have normal expression of EIF4E, but if you take them off of docks, um, you get cell type specific knockdown of EIF4E. And so she wanted to know whether you needed 4E in those um, per, uh, excitatory principal neurons in the LA in order to have uh, uh, memory. And so this is the experimental approach. In this case, she injected two viruses, 
uh, a CAMK2 Cree virus, as well as a, a DOTTA virus, as I mentioned, uh, injected them and then put the animals on docks for two weeks. And then uh, a week before the ready for the study, she took the animals um, off of docks and got knocked down of EIF4E. And sure enough, um, when she tested the memory of these animals after um, two CSUS uh, pairings, she was able to see that the memory was impaired. Okay, so um, that was um, exciting and, and consistent with our hypothesis. Um, but this kind of system, um, although powerful, doesn't have the kind of temporal control that one can, that one really needs to ask specific questions about um, memory consolidation, because you know this effect could be due to, you know. Um, knocking down EI4E and having translation of something um, that's required for memory consolidation not being present at the time that we did the training. So in order to address this question, uh, Priyana had already thought about this even before she um, uh, joined the lab and she took advantage of that first step in translation initiation, which I talked about before, which is um, EIF2, which brings the tRNA uh, initiator tRNA to the ribosome. And this um, um, type of translation, this first step in translation initiation is, is controlled by phosphorylation of EF2L and its alpha subunit. So there are a series of four kinases that respond to cellular stress. And when these um, kinases are activated, there's increased phosphorylation of EIF2 on its alpha subunit, which blocks um, this wanting to exchange factor EIF2B, which puts EIF2, uh, makes it a competitive inhibitor and puts EIF2 in its GDP pound state. And so when that happens, as you can imagine, you get a decrease in overall um, protein synthesis and it's very robust. However, I do need to mention that you do see increases in translation of specific transcripts that have unread open reading frames in the five prime UTR and one of them is actually ATF4, which most of you probably know is CREB2. And so in addition to blocking protein synthesis with EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, you may also um, be blocking CREB-dependent transcription with increased expression of CREB2. Okay. And uh, there are two phosphatases that are responsible for dephosphorylating EIF2. CREP, which is a constitutive, um, uh, regulatory subunit of PP1 and GAD34, which is actually induced um, by EF2 alpha phosphorylation. So it's an inducible regulatory subunit of PP1, which is required to then um, feed back and dephosphorylate EIF2 alpha. Okay, so we'd already known at the time by the work from Mauro Costa Marioli's lab. First one he was in Nahum Sonnenberg's lab and then in his own lab, as well as Kobe Rosenblum, Rosenblum's lab is, and my lab, that these kinases for EIF2 alpha uh, in general are, have, a, if you delete them, there's a large impact on memory processes. In general, the deletion results in um, a lower threshold for inducing plasticity, as well as um, a lower uh, threshold for inducing memory Although um, in some cases, memory could be impaired um, using specific types of training paradigms. And just to uh, emphasize the point, over the years, it's been demonstrated by a number of labs, including our lab, that uh, in both humans and in mouse models of neurodegenerative disease, one of the hallmark features actually turns out to be a chronic increase and EF2 alpha phosphorylation. And if you prevent this phosphorylation either pharmacologically or genetically by targeting these kinases, you can alleviate uh, the memory impairments that take place uh, in these animals. So based on this, um, uh, Priyana uh, decided to um, manipulate the system by generating uh, uh, a, a PKR construct um, that has the kinase domain uh, only, but it still can dimerize and be activated. Oh, and I should mention one other thing. There's a compound um, called ISRIB uh, 
which activates EIF2B, which is this GEB. So this prevents the consequences of EIF2 alpha phosphorylation. So it promotes the putting EIF2 back in this GTP bound state. And um, Peter Walter and, and Nan Sonnenberg's lab have shown that acute application of this rub can actually enhance memory as one might predict by preventing the consequences of EF2 alpha phosphorylation. That's gonna be important control for some of our experiments I'm gonna tell you about. Okay, so um, here's the approach that Priyana did and I talk about good fortune. She came to my lab uh, with this idea and already had uh, generated these mice, although they hadn't been characterized at all. And so the idea was that um, taking advantage of a system that was developed um, by Michael Lynn, who's at Stanford, is that as I said, there's this um, kinase domain of PKR. We have a GFP tag in this case. And the kinase domain has engineered uh, into it a site for a protease, which is NS34A protease. And normally this is a protease that's present in hepatitis C. So when you express this in cells, the protease just chews up the kinase domain and it's not expressed. But if you um, add a drug that targets the protease and inhibits it, what you can see is that within about um, 15 minutes in culture and about 30 minutes in vivo, you see increased expression of IPKR, so the kinase domain, increased phosphorylation of EF2 alpha, and a robust decrease in translation. I'm not gonna show you this data. Um, it's in the um, public uh, paper that was published last year. Um, and so mice were generated and, um, uh, and we had two or three lines and we found one line that ver worked very well. And this is just the targeting um, construct to show you how it's made. And so there's a stop cassette upstream of this. So um, that's, um, um, flanked by LOX P sites, so we have pre dependent control of the expression of the system, so we can get cell type specificity. Uh, and um, we also have engineered into your L10 labeled, um, G uh, a GFP labeled L10, which is a large ribosomal protein. And this is for two purposes it allows us to know which cells um, are expressing the, the whole system. Uh, because of the GFP, but it also will allow us to do translation affinity um, purification to do translational profiling by uh, IPing the GFP and then um, extracting mRNA and, uh, and doing sequencing. And this is just to show that um, when you cross this with a mouse line, like a nest and Cree line where you get neuronal expression, we have um, you know, really uniform expression of the system in neurons and not in any other types of uh, cells. Okay, so, uh, so what um, Priyana wanted to do was to test the system uh, as I described before. So here she's um, um, expressing, has the IPKR mice, she's expressing Cree virally in this case, uh, allows the virus to be there for two or three weeks. Uh, and then when she's ready to do the experiment, she um, trains the animals. And then immediately after training, she infuses the drug that inhibits that protease. And again, within about 30 minutes, there's an increase in expression of PKR, an increased phosphorylation of EF2 alpha, and a decrease in uh, de novo translation in vivo in, um, in uh, excitatory neurons in this case. And so when she does this, you can see on the right here that um, she sees a really robust uh, impairment in memory consolidation. And this impairment in memory consolidation is prevented if the animals are injected with ISRIB um, prior um, to uh, the training. So remember again, ISRIB prevents the consequences of EF2 alpha phosphorylation. So in this case, I think we can say definitively that um, you need to have de novo protein synthesis in these excitatory principal neurons in the lateral amygdala in order to have memory consolidation. Okay, now, once we started doing this, um, I had to learn more about uh, circuitry, uh, which was uh, not, uh, not my uh, strength, but fortunately Priyana uh, came from Nat Heinz's lab, and so she thought about this stuff uh, quite a bit. And one of the, th the striking things about the uh, amygdala system is that
um, to me is that there's um, many of these uh, nuclei uh, that are subnuclei that are present in the amygdala um, can either uh, promote fear or dampen fear, and it depends on the cell types that are uh, that are uh, that you're looking at uh, in the system. And so many people have contributed uh, to this type of work, and uh, especially uh, Andreas Luthi's lab. Uh, and so uh, we were particularly interested in the central lateral amygdala. It re receives input from both the lateral amygdala as well as the thalamus and the cortices. And um, we were interested in it because um, Joe Ledoux's lab a number of years ago had shown that if you inactivate uh, the central um, uh, amygdala with muscimol, it will prevent uh, um, acquisition uh, uh, and consolidation of memory. And moreover, he showed that if you train the animals and infuse anisomycin into the central uh, nuclei of the amygdala, um, you can prevent uh, uh, memory consolidation. So there was evidence that protein synthesis was required in this nuclei. Subsequently, Andreas Luthi's lab um, narrowed this down by showing quite specifically that if you inactivate the central lateral amygdala with muscimol, you can prevent uh, 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 um, uh, memory uh, formation. So we knew that this was important for the acquisition of memory. Now this is an interesting nuclei because um, the majority of, uh, of neurons in the central lateral amygdala are inhibitory neurons. Um, and uh, I would say most of them are either somatostatin or PKC delta expressing inhibitory neurons. Now that they're not exclusively these types of neurons. There are other types of inhibitory neurons in this nuclei. And what's interesting is that um, the, the somatostatin inhibitory neurons are thought to be uh, threat on or fear on neurons. So they normally inhibit these PKC delta neurons, which are the output uh, to the central medial uh, amygdala. And interestingly, the PKC delta neurons, when activated, feed back and inhibit um, the somatostat neurons. Okay, so it's a very interesting uh, microcircuit. And it's interesting that one would need protein synthesis in this microcircuit in order for um, consolidation of, of memory. So we were very interested in defining uh, these cell types. And we were guided um, in part by uh, Bo Lee's studies um, a number of years ago, where he showed that when you condition animals, that you see this long lasting increase in um, AMPA NMDA ratio as an indices of plasticity in the somatostatin positive neurons of the central lateral amygdala. And this, plasticity lasts for at least 24 hours. And so this LTP-like phenomenon, we thought, would be um, something that would require de novo protein synthesis. So we thought for sure that the somatostatin positive inhibitory neurons would require de novo um, translation in order for memory consolidation to take place. Now, um, what Priyana decided to do, though, um, was to not only investigate um, the, the fear on or threat on neurons, but also the threat off neurons, which would be the PKC delta neurons. And so in order to do this, um, she um, decided to do a, a differential threat conditioning paradigm. It's a Q discrimination paradigm where she has um, the CS um, paired uh, with foot shocks, and then she has a, a CS minus a, a different uh, a tone at a different fre frequency interspersed, um, uh, which the animal, of course, shouldn't freeze to when it hears it uh, 24 hours later. So using this kind of paradigm, you can see that the animals um, freeze to the CS plus, um, but they do not freeze um, to the, uh, as much to the CS minus. Okay, so there's very little gen generalization of fear. So the discrimination index ends up being about 60 or 70%. Uh, okay, so um, the first thing that um, Priyana did was um, to define, um, uh, to confirm previous studies to show that um, these um, populations of PKC delta and somatostatin positive inhibitory neurons don't really overlap. And you can see that here. So these are discrete um, populations 
of um, uh, neurons. You can see this both at the RNA level with, um, with um, uh, RNA scope as well as at the immunohistochemical level. Okay, so this is consistent with, um, with uh, previous uh, findings, but we wanted to confirm this for ourselves um, that we didn't see much overlap in the expression of either of these markers. And so, um, so using this kind of differential threat conditioning paradigm, uh, Priyana next just did some biochemical studies to see if the activation of the mTORC1 uh, pathway as well as the dephosphorylation of EF2 alpha takes place in the central lateral amygdala. In fact, that was true. So she could she used um, S6 kinase phosphorylation as a readout for mTORC1. Remember, this is one of the substrates uh, uh, of mTORC1. So that occurs when you train the animals in this type of um, conditioning paradigm. And she also um, observed uh, a, a decrease in the EF2 alpha phosphorylation. And this had been previously demonstrated by a number, number of labs, uh, first by Mauro Costamadioli. So dephosphorylation takes place as we would predict. Interestingly, uh, if you unpair uh, the tone and the shock, you still see uh, a decrease in the EF2 alpha phosphorylation, suggesting that translation um, is initiated even in the unpaired um, situation. Uh, in, uh, for this type of, of translational control. Okay, okay. so um, so then uh, Priyana developed a, a very nice technique um, in which she was able to label newly synthesized proteins in vivo using uh, pyromycin as a label. This is known as uh, sunset, and I won't get into the um, um, to the uh, mechanism by how this happens, but I'll just say that it's a way to label newly synthesized proteins. And so I think what you can see here is when she um, does this type of um, differential threat conditioning, she can see nice robust increases in de novo translation in the central lateral amygdala. Now, in this case, we don't know which cells um, this is occurring in, but I can tell you that in subsequent um, studies, we see this increase in both the somatostatin and the PKC delta um, inhibitory neurons using this paradigm. Okay. So, um, so the first uh, thing she, uh, um, uh, the Priyana did was to take uh, those um, mice from Jerry Pellete that I mentioned before and cross them with either somatostatin CRE or PKC delta CRE line as shown here, and then um, inject a CRE dependent TTA uh, into, the, um, uh, into the central lateral amygdala to get knocked down of EIF4E. Sorry. And uh, this is just to show you that um, we about in, in both cases, we get about um, expression of this uh, short hairpin microRNA for 4E, uh, we get expression in about 50% of the somatostatin inhibitory neurons and about also uh, with the PKC delta neurons, we get about 50% using these uh, Cree lines. And that um, results in a, an effective knockdown of EIF4E. So we see um, significant knockdown of EIF4E in both in the somatostatin uh, uh, um, positive neurons using the somatostatin Cree, and then the PKC delta neurons using the PKC delta Cree. And then consistent with that, we see uh, in, uh, a decrease in de novo translation in both the somatostatin uh, neurons when we knock down uh, in the, uh, 4E in those neurons, as well as when we knock down 4E in the PKC delta neurons. Okay, so the system works as we expect. And so um, when we do the differential, uh, when Priyana did the differential threat conditioning paradigm, what she saw was that um, as we would expect, when she knocks down EIF4E in the somatostatin positive neurons, there's an impairment uh, in memory uh, um, and freezing for the CS with no impact on the discrimination. So even though their memory is impaired, they still can discriminate between the CS plus and the CS minus. However, um, when she knocks down uh, EIF4E in the PKC delta neurons, uh, 
there's no impact on freezing to the CS plus, but uh, the animals um, can no longer discriminate between the CS plus and CS minus. So their safety response is inhibited, um, suggesting that you need de novo protein synthesis uh, in, in the PKC delta neurons for safety uh, conditioning. Okay. So then she uh, went and used the IPKR system that I described before uh, using the same approach. So we have, um, again, either using SOM Cree or PKC Delta Cree lines and crossing them with our um, IPKR line. Uh, and we can do the same type of experiment where we then can train the animals and immediately after training, infuse the drug into the central uh, amygdala. And using this, we uh, see the same types of results. I'll just draw your attention to the lower left. So when we uh, uh, decrease um, protein synthesis via increased EF2 alpha phosphorylation uh, in the uh, somatostatin inhibitory neurons, um, there's an impairment in the uh, consolidation of the memory, but no impact on the um, uh, discrimination memory. Whereas if we, um, increase EF2 alpha phosphorylation and decrease translation in PKC delta neurons. There's no impact on the memory for the CS plus, but there's an impairment uh, in their um, discrimination uh, to, for the CS minus. Okay, so our model of this is that, um, that what happens is that, uh, when you, and I have to say, I was surprised by these findings because I, I assumed that, um, these were two separate types of memory, uh, or excuse me, one type of memory and that there would be one type of neuron that what might um, be involved with respect to the de novo translation. But I think what this tells us that is that there really are the animals learning these two things at the same time. It's learning um, both the threat, about the threat and about the safety, and it needs to trigger de novo translation in, either somatostatin or PKC delta neurons in order for, in the somatostatin neurons for the threat memory and then the PKC delta neurons for the safety memory. And so I think it's um, quite interesting that um, a translational um, response is required in two different types of neurons for two different types of memory that are being formed uh, at the same time. And I think you can use this information to do um, kind of more typical types of chemogenetic and optogenetic studies. And so um, Priyana followed this up by using DREDs where she either had um, uh, uh, an activating DRED uh, shown here as the HM3DQ or an inhibitory DRED um, HMDI uh, and expressed these in either the uh, PKC delta or the somatostatin neurons to see if um, we were correct with the way we thought about this. And I think um, you'll see that we were. So if you inhibit the somatostatin uh, neurons with the DRED, you can see that the, um, there's an impairment um, in the um, um, memory for the CS plus. We also don't see um, much discrimination memory, but you can see that this is a very impaired uh, form of, um, uh, in this case, uh, they just don't have much memory at all for the CS plus which is why there's probably um, not much a, of a discrimination memory. However, if we activate these somatostatin positive neurons, um, you can see that the um, memory for the CM pl CS plus is enhanced and there's no uh, impact on the memory for the CS minus. And when we do this in the PKC delta neurons, you can see that um, when we inhibit these neurons, there's no effect on the memory for the CS plus but there's a, a, a complete impairment uh, for the memory for the CS minus, which is shown here. Okay, so one of the things that's puzzled me about this is that, you know, what is, what is triggering the, the safety memory, right? So this is um, something that's curious to me. Um, so, you know, the CS minus is carrying some kind of information that's being learned. And we, um, we don't know for sure yet. We have done some work focusing on oxytocin neuromodulation. Uh, 
Um, we know from primarily from the work of Ron Stoop that evoked release of endog endogenous uh, oxytocin uh, in the central uh, amygdala attenuates freezing uh, behavior and it can also modulate, uh, mod modulate um, emotional discrimination with respect to stress in mice. So these are previous studies. Um, oxytocin receptors are um, kind of tricky to think of um, as far as triggering translation because they can be coupled to either uh, GS, GI, or GQ, depending on the cell type. And we don't know for sure um, um, in these cells um, which um, it might be triggering. Uh, so Priyana set out to um, uh, figure out which cell types were expressing oxytocin receptors in the central lateral amygdala and consistent with some suggestion in previous other studies, we find that um, the majority of the oxytocin receptors that are expressed in the central lateral amygdala are on the PKC delta neurons, is what, which is what we would have predicted. And that if you um, activate oxytocin receptors with TGOT um, in vivo uh, and look uh, in, or excuse me, um, this is in vitro, exact, uh, ex vivo, I should say, in, in slices. And this is using a different way to tag newly synthesized proteins called um, FUNDCAT. You can see that when we activate oxytocin receptors in the central lateral amygdala, that we can see an increase in de novo protein synthesis in PKC delta expressing inhibitory neurons. Okay, so we think oxytocin can carry this type of signal. And so we have done a couple of experiments. These are um, far from conclusive and there's lots of reasons um, for why, but you can see that, so if we knock down EIF4E in the somatostatin positive neurons, uh, as you would expect, um, there's an impairment uh, for memory for the CS plus. And what's interesting is if you add um, an agonist or infuse an agonist of an oxytocin receptor TGOT, um, you can really boost this discrimination memory. So these animals um, um, have absolutely no freezing at all. Again, suggesting that oxytocin acting on those PKC delta neurons, perhaps through translation, is what's um, um, triggering this increase in um, um, the safety memory. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna stop with this part of the talk. I think I've been talking for 40 minutes. So I'm just gonna say that um, what I think I've shown you so far is that EIF4E and EIF2 dependent translation and principal excitatory neurons is necessary for um, consol uh, consolidation of long-term threat memory. And that either knocking down EIF4E or expressing IPKR and somatostatin, but not uh, PKC delta, uh, there should be inhibitory neurons, uh, impairs um, uh, memory for the threat, but knockdown of EI4E and expression of IPKR and PKC delta neurons impairs um, memory for the safety cube. And we think that the safety cube, the, the memory may be mediated by oxytocin receptor triggering activation of de novo protein synthesis um, in those PKC delta expressing inhibitory neurons. Okay, um, this might be a good place for me to stop and take a couple of questions if anybody has any pressing questions before I go on. Does anybody have any questions? Can, yeah. I, can I ask a question? Yeah, Dean. In the PKC, when you inhibit the PKC delta and you lose this, the differential yeah. conditioning, so it yeah. responds to safety, did you ever do that after conditioning, meaning that is it possible that the effect is just you're decreasing lateral inhibition of the circuit and sort of refinement, you're overgeneralizing the CS plus as opposed to learning the CS minus safety. So, so I guess I'm just asking, did you ever condition the animals normally and then do say the, the dread inhibition of the PKC delta? Yeah, so we, um, so we did not, we add the dread beforehand in the dread experiments. So you're right, there could be generalization in those experiments. I would say with the translation inhibition, you know, we're doing, at least with the IPKR mice, we're pretty, con con we're pretty convinced that because it's immediately after the conditioning, 
it's only in the first hour that we're inhibiting protein synthesis. So I think in that case, it's um, probably not generalization. Okay. But I think the dread experiments are less convincing. And we could, you know, thinking about this, we could address that, right? We could inhibit protein synthesis after the activation of the dreads and after the conditioning. We could try to do that to really nail that down. Yeah. I have a related question, Eric. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering whether you looked at the targets of these two classes of inhibitory neurons, <laughs> the deltas, uh, you know, and yeah. ask whether it's the same targets, which then it would be more along the lines of what Dean just, you know, suggested or different targets, you know, yeah. you know suggesting that these are really giving the animals, you know, the amygdala is giving the animals two different outputs, safety versus threat. Yeah, we have experiments on, you know, on the drawing board, uh, COVID happened and we couldn't, do the experiments that we really wanted to do. And that is to see um, if you do, because we have the perfect system because we can um, use the trap um, construct that's in the mice to see what mRNAs are bound to the ribosome after conditioning uh, with this type of paradigm and see whether the mRNAs that are being bound to the ribosome after the conditioning are the same or if they're different and specific to the one cell type versus the other. That's a great question. And it's something we, of course, would love to know. Okay. Um, other questions? Um, yeah, I'll ask a question. Yeah. So first off, excellent talk. Um, yeah. You mentioned early on in your talk that um, your IPKR system is um, hypothesized to increase either hypothesis. I don't know if you've measured this or just hypothesized that it should increase ATF4 uh, translation. Uh, it does. Have you done it? It does. Okay. Have you done any experiments to see whether or not um, an increase in Krebs repression is mediating the effect? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we we did. <laughs> we were preparing for a reviewer to ask us that. Um, we didn't end up. We 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 have a. Um, of course, what we needed was a, a, a Cree-dependent way to knock down ATF4, right, mm -hmm. uh, and prevent it from happening. Um, so we we have that tool in hand, um, but we we haven't used it yet to see how much uh, how much of this is due to just inhibition of protein synthesis, or how much is the um, inhibition of CREB uh, media transcription contributing to it. My mm -hmm. My suspicion is that um, it's both because this is, you know, if you get dephosphorylation of EF2 alpha with conditioning, one of the things that's likely to happen is that you also have decreased um, ATF4. Mm -hmm. So I think that that, yeah. that control of ATF4 is part of what could, happens when you either inhibit or activate that system. I guess what's kind of arguing in favor of it being completely translational is that uh, you don't see an extra effect with the IPKR system that in addition to what you see with your inhibition of 4E. Right. So, yeah, that was our... Unless, un unless, yeah, yeah that, that it must not... Although I have to say, we didn't we didn't look in our e EI4E system to see if ATF4 expression was altered. Yeah, I guess there might be some <laughs> long-term downstream consequences right. to ATF4 That's there too, yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's it's an interesting idea that, and our kind of way of thinking of this, it may be that the local, although we don't have direct evidence, that local translation could be regulating transcription. And maybe there's some kind of, you know, the ATF4 is synthesized and then trans, transported the nucleus uh, akin to some, you know, kind of work that Kelsey Martin has shown over the years that there's some kind of, you know, synapse to nucleus signaling. Um, so even though, um, Translation is usually thought of as being downstream of transcription. In this case, the local translation might be something that helps to trigger um, translation or transcriptional changes um, mm -hmm. in the nucleus. It's a great question. Yeah. Okay, I think I'll move on, and I, I'm happy to take questions. At the end. I just have a, a, a another ten or fifteen minutes. So, so. Um, so for many years, when people would introduce me to give talks, they would say that um, I'd made um, contributions to our understanding of um, local translation in memory, and that and that was absolutely not true because 
most of the work that we had done had never really focused on local translation, including the work that I just told you about. There was no way to separate out the local, um, the contribution of local translation, let's say in dendrites or axons versus somatic translation. So, but we've started to try to address this and I'll just point out that um, we know that um, polyribosomes that is actively translating ribosomes are present in dendrites. We've known this in many years. This is what a, what a polysem looks like along an mRNA. You've seen these kind of EM structures before. And of course, um, Ozzy Stewart, 30 year, 40 years ago almost now, has shown, was the first to show that you know, there were polyribosomes present in dendritic spines, indicating that you could get um, regulation of gene expression locally independently of uh, transcription, which is kind of important, I think, for um, transducing signals rapidly uh, in dendrites. And so Linnea Ostroff, um, who is a brilliant uh, EM uh, person and neuroscientist in general, um, when she was in Kristen Harris's lab, she showed that when you induce LTP in, in hippocampal slices, that you would see an increase in polyribosomes uh, present at uh, potentiated synapses. And then Linnea um, came to Joe Ledoux's lab and she showed something similar in that when you conditioned animals, um, you could see um, increases in polyribosomes in dendritic shafts and spines in the lateral amygdala. And so um, Linnea um, began collaborating with um, Chuck Hofer, who was in my lab at the time. And, and remember, EIF4E is required to bring the mRNA ultimately to the ribosome. So if you prevent EIF4E from doing that with a drug like uh, 4GI1, you would predict that you would um, 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 prevent perhaps conditioning induced poly uh, ribosomes. And so they did these experiments where they infused 4GI1 or a vehicle into the lateral amygdala um, um, after um, threat conditioning and then did, seri whoops, did serial EM constructions and sure enough, they showed that, um, that there was um, these condition induced changes in the polyribosomes um, were blocked um, by um, preventing EIF4E from uh, bringing the mRNA to the ribosome. Now, what was interesting and surprising uh, when uh, Ledea wanted to do the same type of experiments with um, uh, translation factors to see if they were moving in and out of dendritic spines after conditioning. And so she was doing immuno-EM and what she found was surprising in that she could see, uh, occasionally she could see a polyribosome in a, in a presynaptic terminal. You don't see these very often, but you do see them occasionally. But I think importantly, she, would, she was able to see um, quite often um, translation initiation factors like EIF4E, EIF4G, EIF2-alpha, as well as ribosomal proteins like um, ribosomal protein S6. So there's protein synthetic machinery, and these are in adult axons. And I think now it's not so, um, you know, in the last four or five years, there's been nice studies from Christine Holt and Aaron Schumann's lab um, showing that there's likely to be uh, axonal translation, even in adult um, presynaptic um, terminals. Um, but Linnea um, was doing these experiments and she decided to, to ask if she could just see um, whether ribosomes were present uh, presynaptically. And the approach she took was to take a, a lentivirus that expresses L10. This is again, a, a large ribosomal protein with a YFP tag, which is often used for trap. And so she, can, uh, she infected this in, uh, into the uh, auditory cortex. She could localize this, of course, with an antibody. And then she did EM and she could see um, labeled axons in the lateral amygdala, okay, suggesting that the L10 um, was in axons. And you know, our assumption is um, that it's incorporating into a, a, a ribosome. And so if that's the case, then the question is, what, what mRNAs are they translating? And so because this is the trap approach, um, what Linnea decided to do was, again, transfect the animals, then train them, and then 90 minutes later, dissect out both the cortex and the amygdala and do both um, 
uh, uh, RNA sequencing for both the tissue transcriptome as well as the um, translatome in both the cortex and the axons. And I'm not going to get in, you know, of course, when you train the animals, you get a bunch of things that change. Um, but I think the, the most interesting thing to me that uh, made me think that this is something real is that of half of the learning regulated mRNAs that are bound to the L10, um, about half of them change bidirectionally, meaning that if they, uh, if they're bound to the L10, if they're upregulating the cortex, they're downregulating the axons, or conversely, if they're upregulating the axons, they're downregulating the cortex. And I think that, you know, that's not by chance. Um, I think that really shows that there's some kind of coordination between the soma and the axons with respect to the kind of translation that's taking place. And what's interesting is that um, the things that go um, increase uh, mRNAs bound to um, L10 in the axons and that are down the cortex are translation machinery as well as mitochondria. That kind of makes sense. You might want to have that machinery um, present um, for local protein synthesis. And there's, of course, tons of mitochondria in presynaptic terminals. And conversely, we see a, a decrease in the structural and cytoskeletal mRNAs that are down in the axons, but up in the cortex. OK. So I think one of the questions, of course, is, um, is local translation actually required for memory consolidation, right? This is something that people really assume, but there's really not any great evidence for this yet. And so we want to develop ways to address this. So one way we can get at least on the presynaptic side is by viral delivery of the IPKR system so that we can get Cree-dependent protein synthesis inhibition. So we have this virus um, that works. And so you can imagine for our studies in the amygdala, we can in inject the virus, let's say into excitatory neurons in either the thalamus or the auditory cortex, and then um, get expression in, um, uh, in those neurons. And we should see um, the IPKR present in axon terminals, and then we could inhibit translation with by increasing expression of the IPKR in those terminals. This is just to show you the system works, that if we inject, this is in a somatostatin Cree, that the virus actually will infect um, the somatostatin positive um, inhibitory neurons. Okay, so that's one approach. The second approach that we've been working on, uh, which was unfortunately delayed by COVID, is the generation of a light-activated 4E binding protein for uh, local inhibition. So this is a system um, that Drew Woolley has been working on for many years. And he basically has um, made a, a, a light activatable 4EBP so that when you shine blue light on it, it um, this should be active, not inactive. When it, it exposes the 4EBP and it will bind to EIF4E. So this works really nicely in yeast and he's already published this and showing that it works. So we've put this into a mammalian expression, uh, mammalian plasmid, and we've done these experiments in HEC293 cells. And I think you can see very nicely that if we um, stimulate these cells with respect to protein synthesis with insulin, you get a nice increase in protein synthesis. And if you shine the light on those cells, you can inhibit protein synthesis by light with this light activated 4-EBP. So uh, Heather and Priyana Shressa designed these viruses and um, we're still trying to work this out. But um, so we, we put these into lentiviruses in which we have just the, the, what I just told you, we have the opto 4 ebp But then we have two other variations of this. And one of them has a short um, CAMK2 three prime UTR and one of them has a long three prime uh, CAMK2 uh, UTR. And Aaron Schumann has shown that this short three prime UTR will limit it, um, localization of the mRNA um, to the soma. And whereas the long three prime UTR, you have predominant expression in um, distal, proximal and distal dendrites, you do still get some expression in soma. And this is just to show when you use this um, type of um, approach, in, at least in cultured neurons, it works pretty well. So, sorry, this was masked just so I could show you that. Um, you can see with the short three prime UTR, you don't see much expression 
in the dendrites, whereas with the long three prime UTR of K, uh, for KMK2, you see really robust expression in dendrites. So we think this may be a way that we may be able to differentially um, inhibit translation in dendrites, which has been kind of the holy grail for many people. We don't know whether this will work or not. Um, we, we've tried a few experiments where we've injected it into animals. Um, we just don't um, have any definitive answers yet. So um, I look forward to um, uh, sharing that with you sometime soon. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll stop there um, and thank the people that did the work. So most of the work I told you today um, was done by Priyana Stresva, who was just a, a fantastic um, postdoc and colleague, really talented. She now has started her own lab at uh, Stony Brook. Uh, Linnea Ostroff, who I mentioned earlier, she has her, now has her own lab at the University of Connecticut. Heather Bowling, who did some of the light activated work, she's now um, scientific director at, a, a, at a, a biotech startup company. And here's my current members of the lab who uh, have been really troopers through all of COVID. As all of you know, this has been a year of incredible challenges, um, but these people uh, make it all worthwhile. They've done a great job in keeping the lab going under really difficult circumstances where, you know, mouse breeding is limited, number of people in labs are limited, but uh, I'm really happy that we're getting close to being up to full speed and hopefully we'll make better progress in the next year. So I'll stop there and take any questions you have. Thanks.